Oh, you believe, give charity for the pleasure of Allah, the pleasure of Allah. Oh, you believe, read the Quran every night of Ramadan, night of Ramadan. Welcome, oh Ramadan. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, the mercy, and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Welcome to the show Ramadan A Date with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers. And today, we will be discussing the topic, common errors committed by Muslims during the month of Ramadan. So, without further ado, let's ask the first question of Dr. Zakir Naik. Dr. Zakir, what are the reasons behind Muslims continually falling into these same errors, Ramadan after Ramadan? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah. The main reason that Muslims keep on committing the same errors in the month of Ramadan regarding the rules and regulations of fasting is lack of knowledge of the deen, of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the major reason for this lack of knowledge is because most of the Muslims, they do not read the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not read the Quran with understanding. Neither do they read the hadith, the authentic sayings of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad What we Muslims should do is read the Quran with understanding, read the sayings of the Prophet and the seer of the Prophet. Then inshallah, at least we will have the basic knowledge of our deen, including the rules and regulations of fasting. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he always opens up his pathway. He gives guidance to the Muslims, but there is a criteria to whom does he guide? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah An Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 69, that those who strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who do jihad fi sabilillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens his pathways for them. So the criteria for us to get the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the criteria for us where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up our pathways is to strive in his way, to do jihad fi sabilillah. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 43, as well as Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7, Allah says, Fas alu ahal zikri in kuntum la ta'lamun, which means, if you do not possess, or if you doubt, then ask the person who possesses the knowledge. If you doubt anything, Ask the person who's knowledgeable. And Alhamdulillah, we have in our Ummah several Muslims who are scholars in this deen. So it's our duty to ask these scholars, these people who have the knowledge of Islam regarding the rules and regulations of our deen. As far as fasting is concerned, which is one of the important pillars of Islam, Every Muslim should know at least when is the time for fasting, what are the basic rules and regulations. And today, in this age of science and technology, it's very easy to find. It is only the negligence of a Muslim that makes him unaware of these things. It's very easy today to know when is the time for fasting, when does fast begin, when is the time for suhar, when is the time for iftar, for breaking the fast, what are the things that break the fast, etc., etc. It is mainly due to the negligence and ignorance of the Muslims that we regularly keep on falling and committing the same mistakes. Furthermore, what are the common errors that are made by Muslims during the holy month of Ramadan? The common errors committed by the Muslims in the month of Ramadan can be broadly classified into four categories. The first category is the common errors committed by Muslims regarding 
the obligatory rules and regulations of fasting. The second category is the common errors committed by Muslims which are contradictory to the sunnah of fasting. The third category is the errors committed by Muslims mainly due to neglecting the obligatory duties in Islam and indulging in acts which are prohibited. And the fourth category is the other common errors committed by Muslims in the month of Ramadan. Clearly, Dr. Zakir, it's going to be difficult for us to um, discuss all of the common errors made by Muslims during the month of Ramadan in this one interview. But over the next 32 days, we will inshallah try to cover those issues. But could you just um, state or list the most grievous mistakes made by Muslims in the month of Ramadan? As far as the common errors that fall in the first two categories, inshallah, we'll be discussing in detail in the next inshallah 30 days. I will inshallah speak about the common errors committed in the third and fourth category. Before we discuss categories three and four, can we at least list the most common errors from sections one and two? The most grievous amongst the errors in the first category, that is errors committed regarding the obligatory rules and regulations of fasting is, the most common is that Muslims many a times they don't do the niyyah for fasting. Intention is very important. Without niyyah, without intention, the fasting is not accepted. So making intention is obligatory. And we'll be discussing this, inshallah, in detail, inshallah, tomorrow. The second error is that many a times, Muslims, even after the Fajr, Azan has started, yet they continue eating. And they think that the end of Suhoor time is only at the end of the Fajr Azan. In fact, the moment the Fajr Azan starts, the moment the beginning of dawn starts, the Suhoor time ends. So this is an error which normally nullifies or invalidates the fast. The third error in the first category is that many people, they delay paying their Zakat al-Fitr. And many times they pay after the Eid al-Fitr Salah. If we pay the Zakat al-Fitr after Eid al-Fitr, then it is like normal charity. It does not come under the Zakat al-Fitr. So these three are the most grievous in the first category. The common errors committed in the second category, that is errors that are contradicting the Sunnah of the fasting is number one. Many people, they skip their suhoor. Some people, they have an early suhoor. That is, they have the suhoor one or two hours before the Fajr time. In fact, suhoor is a blessing. Every Muslim should have it. And the Prophet said, we should delay the suhoor as much as possible. We should have it till just before the Fajr time. The third mistake committed by Muslims in this category is that they delay opening their fast. They delay the iftar. And our Prophet ﷺ said that the people will be good as long as they hasten in breaking the iftar. That means immediately after sunset, they should break the iftar. The fourth common error in this category is that many Muslims, they read unauthentic dua during iftar. The most authentic dua, as far as iftar is concerned, is Zahab al-Zama, Wabta al uruku wa sabat al-Arj, inshallah. Which means that my thirst is quenched, the veins are moistened, and the ajr is near, inshallah, God willing. The reward is near, God willing. And some people, when they read this dua for breaking the fast, they say it before breaking the fast. Before they put their date in the mouth, they say this. 
and it's contrary to the meaning. The meaning says that my thirst has been quenched. Zahaba zama, wapta lati uruku. My thirst has been quenched and the veins have been moistened. Your thirst cannot be quenched before breaking the fast. So normally it should be said, after you eat the khujur, after you have water and you're satisfied, maybe after some minutes, after you break the fast, then you can eat this dua. Zahaba zama, wapta lati uruku. Wasabat al ajr, inshallah. Which means, my thirst has been quenched. The veins have been moistened. The reward is near, inshallah, God willing. The sixth common error made by Muslims in this category is that many Muslims, they eat excessively during iftar. And many of them even eat throughout the night. The seventh common error is that many of them, they are negligent as far as Tarawi is concerned. Because Tarawi is not a fard, they think it is no problem if a Muslim misses Tarawi. Though Tarawi is not a fard, it's a very important sunnah. And a Muslim who misses Tarawi is missing a great deal of reward. And many Muslims who perform Tarawi, they read Tarawi very fast, 10 miles per hour. They try and finish it in a short time and they defeat the purpose. In fact, you should read with a moderate pace so that people understand and they grasp the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ninth common error is that those who go for itikaf in the mosque, many of them, they socialize during itikaf, as though it's a time to meet people and friends, which is totally contrary to the sunnah. The tenth common error is that many of the Muslims think that the Laylatul Qadr is on the 27th night of Ramadan. And they only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this night. In fact, the beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, search for the Laylatul Qadr in the odd nights of the last 10 days, the last Ashra, the 10 days. Therefore, Laylatul Qadr can fall either on the 21st night or 23rd or 25th or 27th or 29th. So this is one of the common errors made by Muslims. The eleventh common error is that they spend their time during Ramadan in unproductive work rather than spending in zikr and worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They should spend their time rather for offering besides the compulsory salah, the nawafil, the voluntary salah, the sunnah salah. The twelfth error made by the Muslims is that they should do dua. The thirteenth is they should ask for forgiveness. This is month of forgiveness. Fourteenth is they should read the Quran as much as possible to get the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fifteenth is that they fast and they keep themselves hungry but basically they're not mentally prepared for that fast. And it is as though they are staying hungry. But the main purpose of fasting to acquire taqwa is not obtained. This was in brief regarding the second category. Can you mention briefly, again, categorize the uh, common errors made in the third category? The common errors committed by Muslims in the third category, that is errors regarding negligence in performing the faraid the obligatory duties in Islam, is that Muslims, many of them, they stay awake the full night. They have an early suhr, and these people, they do not offer the Fajr Salah. Missing Fajr Salah is a sin. Many of them, because they stay awake the full night, they sleep the full day, and they even miss their zuhr and the Asar Salah, which is a grave sin. You're trying to acquire blessings and you're neglecting the obligatory duties, which is totally prohibited. Many of the Muslims, they do not give zakat. Those are supposed to give zakat. And zakat is one of the pillars of Islam in which every Muslim who has a saving of the nisab level, that is those who have a saving of 85 grams of gold, they should give 2.5% of their savings 
every lunar year in charity, it's called as zakat. And the fourth error in the third category is that most of the Muslims give zakat, but they do not calculate the zakat properly. As far as common errors committed by Muslim month of Ramadan, that is indulging in prohibited acts, the most common is though these acts are prohibited for a Muslim, irrespective whether it's a month of Ramadan or non-Ramadan, but specifically, we should be more careful. We should be careful trying to avoid these acts throughout our life. But in Ramadan, we should be more careful. And the most common, number one, where Muslims involve themselves is backbiting and slandering. Backbiting is a grave sin. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Jurat, chapter 49, verse number 12, that those who backbite, they are people who eat the dead meat of their own brother. So backbiting and slandering is one of the gravest sins. The second common error in this category is Muslims, many of them, they use false speech. They tell lies during the month of Ramadan. The third is they use abusive language, which is contrary to the spirit of Islam and of Ramadan. The fourth is they use vulgar language. And the fifth is, they involve themselves in gossiping. The sixth is, some of them involve in false action. The seventh is, many of the Muslims, to kill time, they listen to music and un-Islamic songs, which is totally prohibited in Islam. The eighth common error is, Many of the Muslims, to kill time, they watch un-Islamic television programs and un-Islamic movies. The ninth common error committed by Muslim is that many of the Muslims, they read un-Islamic magazines, un-Islamic books, un-Islamic pictures, which are all prohibited in Islam. The tenth common error done by Muslims in this month is many of them, they go to un-Islamic sites on the internet, which is again prohibited. The eleventh common error is that they spend excessively and they commit extravagance. And the twelfth is there is a lot of wastage of food. So this was in brief regarding the list of mistakes done by Muslims commonly in the third category. That is indulging in acts which are prohibited and neglecting acts which are first in Islam. So Dr. Zakir, what are the other common errors committed by Muslims during the month of Ramadan? The other common errors committed by Muslims in the month of Ramadan, that is the fourth category, is number one is that many of the Muslims, they stay awake the full night and then they sleep in the day. And they do the normal activity at the night time and sleep in the daytime. They're converting day into night and night into day, and the whole purpose of fasting is defeated. The second error in this category is that many of the Muslims, they remain lazy and they're inactive during the daytime, which is contrary to the spirit of fasting. The third common error is that many of the Muslims, they try and kill their time during the day by playing, by amusement, by games, which defeats the purpose again. The fourth common error is Muslims, they give lavish iftar parties and they spend a lot of money, mainly trying to show off. The fifth common error, many of the Muslims, they ask the women folk in their family to prepare a variety of dishes for iftar and for sohr, thus making the women in the family spend the majority of the time in the kitchen. In fact, the family should spend most of the time in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if the women folk do more duas, inshallah, even the men will benefit. Even their sin will be forgiven, inshallah. The sixth common error is that many of the Muslims, they renovate their house 
and the shop in the month of Ramadan, spend more time in that than remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The seventh common error is that many of the Muslims, they spend their nights instead of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in activities which are unproductive. For example, they spend their time in excessive socializing after Taraweeh. That is the eighth error. Ninth is, many of the Muslims, they spend many nights and most parts of their nights in shopping. The tenth common error is, many of the Muslims, they spend most of the time in the night in eating. The eleventh is, many of the Muslims, they spend their time in robing and in loitering during the night. And the twelfth common error is, the last ten days of Ramadan are mainly the days in which the Muslims should do more ibadah. But most of the Muslims, they spend time in shopping, in celebrating, and preparing themselves for Eid. And most of them spend time in activities which are unproductive rather than spending the time in ibadah. These are some of the other common errors which Muslims commit. And I hope, inshallah, that they will abstain from these errors in future. Inshallah. Ajmain. So the next uh, question is, um, are there any common errors that you can mention relationship to culture and country? All the errors that I mentioned earlier were general Muslims throughout the world. There are some errors which are made mainly by people living in a certain country, belonging to a certain culture. For example, in the Indian subcontinent, there are people living in India, in Pakistan, in Sri Lanka. During Ramadan, many of the Muslims, in the night, they play night cricket and they spend most of the time in night cricket rather than doing ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this playing night cricket is more common in the Indian subcontinent. Now if you go to the Arab countries, especially the Gulf countries, there many of the offices, many of the working places, that is in the market, etc., they change their timings. They hardly work for a couple of hours in the daytime and they open most of the time during night. So what happens, it encourages people to do shopping in the night rather than in the day and they get more business and they're inviting people rather in spending time in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Muslims spend their time in shopping and eating during night time. And furthermore, those people who are employed in the shops, they're forced to come at night time because it's their duty. So these Muslims are even preventing their employees, rather than remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're involving themselves in business and spending most of their time in activities which are not according to the sunnah. Dr. Zakir, are there, to your mind, any important sunnahs of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that people avoid because they feel it will nullify their fast? Yes, there are a few sunnahs of the Prophet which many Muslims avoid thinking it will break their fast or it is makru. And the most important sunnah of the Prophet which people avoid during Ramadan is using the sawakh, using the tooth stick. Many Muslims feel that if they use this, it is makru. The main reason is there's a hadith of Muhammad a hadith which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, book of fasting, hadith number 1900, and four, where the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, I swear by Allah, in whose hand is the soul of Muhammad, peace be upon him, that the breath of the person who fasts is more sweeter to Allah than the scent of musk. Now, based on this hadith, many Muslims think that if they use the sawakh, the breath, the bad breath, or the foul breath, of the person who fast will not be there and it will not please Allah. That's the reason they avoid using sawakh. Now these people, they fail to realize that when we use the stick, sawakh, it does not remove the breath, the foul breath, or the breath which people normally don't like of the person who fast. The sawakh mainly brushes the gums. It cleans the teeth. It helps in keeping the teeth healthy, but in no way does it reduce the breath, especially of the person who fasts. And furthermore, there's a sunnah of the Prophet, 
the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number two, hadith number 887, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that if it wouldn't have been too hard for my ummah, I would have made it compulsory for them to use the sivak, the tooth stick, before every prayer. Or to use the tooth stick while doing wudu. Like how wudu is a requirement before salah. The Prophet, if it wouldn't have been too difficult for the ummah, he would have made it compulsory to use the tooth stick. And here, he did not mention any exceptions. Other he would have said, I would have made it compulsory for my ummah except during fasting. This important sunnah, surely if this would have been makhru while fasting, would have nullified the fast, surely he would have mentioned it. So this proved that this important sunnah, which Muslims should continue doing, even during the month of Ramadan, even while fasting, it will not nullify the fast. It's not makhru, in fact, it is mustahab, it's encouraged. And the other important sunnah, which people neglect or avoid, mainly fearing that it will spoil their fast or nullify their fast, is putting water in the nostrils, sniffing the water, normally, especially during wudu. So many of the Muslims, even when they do wudu, they just get the water close to the nose and touch the tip of the nose to the water, that's it. They don't put the water into the nostrils and they clean their nose, they don't sniff it, which is a requirement for wudu, thinking that if they sniff, it may break the fast. Water entering through the nose into your throat will nullify the fast. But the chances are very negligible. What our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Asai Hadith of Abu Dawood, volume number two, Hadith number 2360. Our beloved Prophet said that when you do wudu, sniff the water excessively, except in fasting. So normally when we do wudu, we sniff the water excessively, except in fasting. Because in fasting, if we sniff excessively, there are chances, though very negligible, for it to enter the throat and nullifying your fast. But normally when we put water in the nostrils, there are no chances of it going in the throat. So only care that we have to take while fasting is don't sniff excessively, but we have to put the water in the nostrils and clean the nostrils, which is the important sunnah, which many of the Muslims neglect, and they avoid it, especially during wudu. And here since the Prophet clearly mentioned except fasting. During the sivakh, he said, I would have made it compulsory had it not been difficult for my ummah. There, because he doesn't say fasting, it means that seva can be used while fasting and sniffing should not be done excessively, but normally water should be put in the nostrils while doing wudu. So these two important sunnahs, which people out of ignorance, they avoid during fasting. Now, Dr. Zakir, next question is a very common question and it's one that I'd like to know the answer to as well. It's um, if all the devils are chained during the month of Ramadan, how come people continue to commit sins? And I do agree with you, this is a common question. And I remember several years back when I was in school and when I heard this hadith that the devils are chained in the month of Ramadan, immediately the question that came to my mind and the question that comes to many Muslims' mind and many non-Muslims is that if the devils are chained, then how do people, how do human beings yet commit sins? This question is based on the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu which I mentioned earlier, a Sahih hadith of Musnad Ahmad, volume number two, page number 230, hadith number 7148, which is also repeated in Sunan Nisai, chapter number five, hadith number 2106, where the beloved Prophet said that, O oh, people, the blessed month of Ramadan is approaching. And Allah has ordained for you that you fast in this month. And the gates of heaven will be open in this month and the gates of hell will be closed. And the devils will be chained. In this month is a night, which is better than a thousand months. And a person who is deprived of the blessing in this month is truly a deprived person. Now, when we give this hadith, it clearly mentions that in this month of Ramadan, the devils will be chained. And it's a logical question. If devils are chained, then how do human beings yet
commit sins. To make the people understand, we have to realize that when the devils are chained, it does not mean that the devils are slain. They have been killed. They are yet present, but they are chained. They are not killed. The power is yet there, but it is diminished. For a better understanding, I'd like to give you an example that when there is a lion or a tiger who is free, there are high chances that he may kill you. Your life is in danger. But the moment that tiger or that lion is chained, you are safe. You are safe as long as you maintain a safe distance. After the tiger has been chained, if you come too close to him, there are chances, yet you can be killed. So as long as you maintain that distance from the tiger who is chained, you are safe. Similarly, in the month of Ramadan, if you maintain a safe distance from the Satan, you will be saved. And if you read the Quran, Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 168, Be careful of the khutwa to shaitan, of the footsteps of the devil. For he is to you an avowed enemy. Many places Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that be careful of the footsteps of the devil. Allah doesn't say that be careful of the devil. Because a normal Muslim, an average Muslim, who has average Iman, when he sees the devil in front of him, he will be careful. For example, suppose there is a young girl who comes to an average Muslim, a young boy, who has average Iman. If a young girl comes and tells him that let's spend the night together, that Muslim will say, spending the night together with a girl, it's haram, it is zina. He will immediately object. But that same girl, if that girl phones that young boy and speaks to him on the phone, the boy will say, speaking to a girl on the phone, there is no problem. So he speaks to the girl for a few times on the phone for a few minutes. Later on, the girl says, let's go and have some snacks in McDonald's on Kentucky Fried Chicken. Having snacks for a few minutes, for half an hour with a girl in McDonald's, no problem. So he goes and has snacks with the girl in McDonald's. Later on, the girl says, why not have dinner in a restaurant? Having dinner with a girl in a restaurant for a couple of hours, no problem. Then the girl says, why not spend the night together? And then the boy says, spending the night together with a girl, no problem. So this is khutwa to shaitan, footsteps of the devil. This is not mentioned in the Quran, this is just my own example. So what Allah warns us is that be careful of the khutwa to shaitan, the footsteps of the devil. If the devil comes directly in front of an average Muslim who has iman, he will abstain. He will run away from it. But the khutwa to shaitan are the things which are dangerous. So what we have to realize when the devil is chained, his footsteps are restricted. So many of the sins are prevented. But if we go close to him, then the chances that we'll be overtaken by the devil and commit a sin are very high. So what we have to be careful, that in Ramadan, if we keep the distance, then the chance of committing sin is less. But if we go close to the Satan, even though he's chained, like how a tiger can walk, even after his chain, same the devil. So this is my understanding. When the beloved prophet said, the devils are chained, the devil can yet move. But less distance, so if we keep the distance, we'll be safe. The second reason that I feel is that in the month of Ramadan, though the devils are chained, we fail to realize that the balanced 11 months, they are free. And the impact that the devil has on the human beings for these 11 months, it leaves those impact, that impression in the month of Ramadan. To give a better understanding, I always give the example that there are drug peddlers which try and get customers, the youngsters from the colleges, from the universities. So what they do initially, they give the drug free. And they entice the youngsters for having drugs. Later on, after some time, they charge a nominal amount for that drug. Later on, they charge an exorbitant amount. But by the time, the youngster is already hooked on to the drug.
So even if the drug dealer is not there, they will try and find where the drug dealer is. They will go out of the way to find him and get the drug. And many of them, even if the drug peddler, the drug dealer is imprisoned by the law, they will go out of the way to find someone else. They may go in a chemist shop and buy mandrix, whatever it is. They are so much hooked on to it. So these people who have become addicts to drugs, or rather say, addicted to the Satan, even though the Satan is imprisoned, the effect is yet there. So this we understand as a drug dealer, as a drug peddler, even after he goes, the drug addict gets accustomed to that drug. So we human beings, we are accustomed to the sin. And even though the Satan is imprisoned, we keep on committing these mistakes. But mainly those people who have become addicts fall in this category. So those who do major sin fall in this category. But the normal Muslims, the average Muslims who haven't become addicted, it's easy for them to stay away from sin. And the third reason that I give is that though there are some scholars who say that in this month of Ramadan, the strong devils, the marids, they're imprisoned. The smaller ones are free. So they keep on committing mistakes. But according to my understanding, the third reason is that though the devils are chained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they can yet whisper. And one of the ways the devils try and get the human beings close to them is by whispering. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nas, chapter number 114, verse number 1 to 6, Qul a'uzu bi rabbin nas, malikin nas, ilahin nas, min sharril wasfasil khan nas, alladhi yu wasfithu fi thudurin nas, min al jinnati wal nas. They whisper in the hearts of the human beings and they withdraw. Amongst them, the jinn and men. It's talking about the Satanists, talking about the devils, who whisper into the hearts of the human being and they withdraw. And among these devils are the jinn and the human beings. So maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has imprisoned the devils who are the jinn. But the human beings, we, are yet free. So one category of devils that the jinns have been imprisoned but the Satanists are even amongst the men. That's what Allah says, who are yet free. And yet we have to be careful of the whisper of the devil, the waswasa. This waswasa mainly is the thing that attracts towards the sin. The sins they had committed, but the chances are less. And furthermore, it's clearly mentioned in the full hadith that Allah has ordained for you in this month of Ramadan that you should fast. Only if you fast, according to me, will the devils be imprisoned. That's talking about the devils that are going to attract you. So Allah says, if you fast, Allah has ordained for you fasting, and the devils will be put in chains. So the devils that are after you, if you fast, surely they'll be restricted. The criteria for us to be away from the devil is to fast. If you fast with the proper niyyah, seeking the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, surely the devil will not be able to entice you. And the best logical way to prove this is if we check the crime rate of the Muslim countries during Ramadan, it goes down. But if you check the crime rate of the non-Muslim countries in Ramadan, it is the same. The reason is that because they are not fasting, the non-Muslims, this devil yet has an effect on them. Because the Muslims are fasting, if not all properly, at least majority, or at least quite a large number. So because of that, the crime rate in the Muslim countries in the month of Ramadan is low as compared to the other months. But the crime rate in the non-Muslim country is approximately the same, indicating otherwise, even the non-Muslims, they will not commit any sins. So the criteria is that you have to fast properly, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, the last question today regarding Prophet Muhammad's statement, which you mentioned in your last answer, regarding the fact the, uh, the gates of uh, paradise are open and the gates of hell are closed. Does this mean that we will be going to paradise if we die in this blessed month? This again is the same question, it is the same hadith. Same hadith which I quoted earlier of Musnad Ahmad, one number two. 
page number 230, hadith number 7148, and it also appears in Sunan Nisai, chapter number 5, hadith number 2106. Again, the same hadith, the Prophet said, he told the people that the blessed month of Ramadan is approaching, and Allah has ordained for you that you fast in this month. And in this month, the gates of heaven will be open, and the gates of hell will be closed, and the devils will be chained. And this month is the night of Qadr, which is more blessed than a thousand months. And a person who is deprived of the pleasures, of the blessings in this month, is truly a deprived person. Here again, this is a common question, that if the gates of heaven are open and the gates of hell are closed, then anyone who dies but naturally will go to Jannah, because the gates of hell are closed and Jannah open. Does it mean that even if a non-Muslim dies in this month, even he'll have to go to Jannah? The reply to this question is, when Allah says that in this month of Ramadan, the gates of heaven are open, it means the gates of heaven are inviting you to enter Jannah. That means that even if you do a small deed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will multiply your reward. Another prophet said that every deed will get a reward 10 times. And in this month, it's very easy to enter Jannah. When a prophet said, the gates of hell will be closed, indicating that to enter hell is difficult in this month. Why? Because the taqwa level rises. And the chance of you to commit sin is less. And furthermore, if you fast the full month in the month of Ramadan, seeking Allah's reward, all your past sins will be forgiven. So the moment a person fasts in this complete month of Ramadan, seeking Allah's reward, all his past sins are completely forgiven. So if the past sins are forgiven, the chances of him going to hell is nil. But what we have to realize, the criteria for the gates of heaven to be open and the gates of hell to be closed is that you have to fast. And furthermore, to enter Jannah, you require a ticket. The ticket to go to Jannah is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, where Allah says, Wal Asr, inna insan la fi khusr, illa lazin amnu, wa amilu salihati, wa tawasu bil haq wa tawasu bil sabr. That by the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who do righteous deeds, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. This surah, according to Imam Shafi, he said that only if this surah was to be revealed of the Quran, it would have been sufficient for the salvation of mankind. So important is. It is called as Rahe Nijat, the way for salvation. And the criteria for any human being to enter Jannah is four. First is Iman, second is righteous deeds, third is exhorting people to truth, and fourth is exhorting people to patience and perseverance. So here we realize that the gates of heaven are open, but just because the gates are open, you can't enter, you require the ticket. The ticket is Iman. The ticket is righteous deed. Exhorting people to truth, exhorting people to patience and perseverance. And to get this ticket is very easy in the month of Ramadan because the Iman level rises in the month of Ramadan. Furthermore, your righteous deed, the reward is multiplied. It's easier. You can call people to truth your patient level increases. So this hadith means that you have to have the criteria. Then inshallah, you should go to Jannah and you will not go to hell. But that doesn't mean that 100% people who die will go to Jannah. Surely, those who are non-believers, they have got no iman. So there's no question that they will enter Jannah. If a person has to enter Jannah, he requires a ticket. And the ticket to Jannah is Surah Al-Asr. Furthermore, if you read the hadith, it says that only if you fast in the month of Ramadan, that means, and you follow all the rules and regulations, and abstain from things which are prohibited, then the doors of heaven will be open and the gates of hell will be closed. Furthermore, it says, in this month is a night which is equivalent to more than 1,000 months, indicating that even if you pray and worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this one night, it will be equivalent to more than a thousand months, is about more than 80 years. Imagine. So the chances for you to get a reward only in this one night 
is more than a lifetime. An average human being lives for 60 years. So one Laylatul Qadr is more than a thousand months, is about more than 80 years, more than average life of a human being. The chances are very easy to go to Jannah. And the ending part of the Hadith says, a person who is deprived of these blessings is truly a deprived person, indicating that everyone will not go to Jannah. Everyone will not find the doors of heaven open. It says, the ending part, very important, that a person who is deprived of the blessings in this month is truly a deprived person. That means telling us Muslims that if you cannot get the benefits of the month of Ramadan, and then if you cannot go to Jannah, then you are truly a deprived person. That even includes the non-Muslims who have in the Hidayah, they are truly the deprived people. So Dr. Zakir, well, Jazakallah khair, and I thank you for those intriguing answers, particularly pertaining to the last two questions which you answer so eloquently. MashaAllah, alhamdulillah. Brothers and sisters, I hope you benefited as much as I did today. I listened to the show. And tomorrow we shall be discussing an introduction to Ramadan, insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum until tomorrow at the same time. <laughs> يومنا صبر ورق بدموع البائسين رمضان قد أهل بالصيام وأطل مسعدا أهلا وخلا لتوفي كل